studying the processes and effects that govern evolution of matter in the universe from the Big Bang to today. The particular area of expertise is the evolution of nearby galaxies to our own and how they build up their chemical elements over time. Andrew commenced his PhD at the time that Hubble was launched and Hubble started uh, beaming back uh, those images. And uh, I think we all remember that it was almost a fatal start. <laughs> almost a fatal start. Yeah. Uh, and to quote Andrew, he notes he's, he's got on his uh, profile page. There was a lot of buzz about all the things that could be done with these super sharp images. I looked at an early result that was hot off the press and asked my supervisor, why is this like that? The supervisor said, nobody understands that, and I thought I need to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> but Andrew's inquiring on the result. And of course, it was resolved, probably the merits, and it's, it's, it's been 25 years of test work since. Uh, Andrew is the director of the Green Hill Observatory, a busy tier. Uh, which houses the 1.3 metre uh, Harlington telescope. So I'm looking forward to Andrew's presentation tonight. Would you all welcome Andrew? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that introduction. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. You don't have to believe every uh, very wordy thing you see on the university's website. Really, what I like is to look at the Magellanic Clouds. Um, so coming to the Southern Hemisphere was kind of a natural thing for me to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate to uh, be involved with the university here and with this, uh, this kind of fun project in particular. Can everybody hear me OK? So, all right, yeah, excellent. Good. Um, some of you may know some of this already or, or much of it. Um, so feel free to interrupt, ask questions, uh, ask for clarification or further information at any time. Um, most of this will be sort of retrospective, looking back at the past couple of years of getting the observatory up and running, and just like a quick kind of science highlight. Um, but I'm happy to discuss kind of any aspect of, of what we do and who's doing it and what we hope to be doing. So just to set the scene, um, the university's previous uh, major optical telescope was a 40-inch, a one-meter telescope. Uh, just up the hill that way, I guess, um, on uh, Canopus Hill. Um, and the new one is up here in the Midlands, just a bit off the, off the highway. If you are coming from Launceston to Hobart on the Midland Highway, just after you pass Oatland, so coming down through here, uh, if the light is correct and if you're able to kind of take your eyes off the road for just a minute, there's a point at which the road directly looks at our hill. Um, so you kind of can look up the view this way and, uh, and see the dome. At times, quite clearly. At, at other times, you have to really search for it. If you're coming uh, north from Hobart, it's much more difficult to see because it's kind of over a, over a hill. And uh, that has the advantage that it's protected from the Hobart city lights. Um, but it does make it um, kind of tricky to find on the way through. So this is uh, our kind of standard aerial photograph that we like to show off. Um, just because the light was really good. Obviously, we've got the, the dome uh, up there with uh, sort of lots of support infrastructure. Um, and then a, a covered walkway, uh, which is really nice at 4 a.m. on an August, uh, August night. Uh, if you have to go uh, to the loo or to get a cup of coffee um, down at this, uh, this area. So this area is a kitchen and uh, two bedrooms. So there's sleeping for four. And then there's sort of a workshop. And the intention is that the control room will kind of sit up in here um, eventually. This sort of red architectural feature goes back to a marketing campaign that the university had a few years ago where they were advertising it. Well, red is the university's color. And it was sort of the door to knowledge or the door to better life outcomes or something. And the architect. Uh, decided it would be really great to have that theme carried through, but the red door would be missing. So it's like a, a red frame. Um, so that's, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting, I suppose. Um, <laughs> yes. We do have uh, mains power, 240 volt, single phase. But um, there's a pretty large battery backup, uh, so we can run uh, if the mains power goes down, which it 
does on a semi-regular basis. Uh, we have batteries that are continually charged by the solar. It's a five kilowatt system. And that is enough to observe for, uh, I think, two to three hours and then shut everything down safely, um, which is kind of a nice thing to be able to have. So that's where things stand now. And if I sort of jump back in time, this is the Canopus uh, Observatory one meter telescope in a photo that was taken by Shevel Mathers, uh, obviously um, looking at the rather nice background rather than the, the telescope. But since the dome happened to be open, um, it's a nice shot of the one meter telescope. The other telescope on the site was a 16 inch telescope. Um, and those instruments uh, saw some pretty heavy use uh, over the years and, um, and uh, served the university pretty well. But by the mid 2000s, it was obvious that mainly light pollution was becoming a very uh, big issue, but also just mechanical wear on the, uh, on the drives, on the bearings. It was making it difficult to point and track accurately. The one meter telescope was an F11 system. And um, it was a little bit too slow for modern applications where we might want to feed the light down the f an optical fiber and put that into a spectrograph, um, which is something that is in really, really high demand by astronomers. Um, we, there's a real shortage worldwide, but especially in the southern hemisphere, of one to two meter size telescopes with high quality spectrographs. And with a spectrograph, you can take the chemical fingerprint of a star, you can measure its uh, redshift or its blue shift, uh, from the uh, spectral lines, um, and it's basically, uh, well, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures. Um, the modern spectrographs, uh, which are sort of fed through optical fibers, uh, work best at about f6, or maybe even faster than that. Um, so uh, this telescope was sort of not perfectly well suited for that. and. Um, just uh, by also sort of shifting down to a lower F ratio, we were hoping to go for a, a wider field of view. Um, yeah, but the main, the main two motivators for a new system were just the sort of age and the location. Um, um, so just to sort of highlight the light pollution issue, this is probably something you're, you're all very familiar with. So this is the International Dark Sky Association map from a few years ago of kind of Southeast Australia. Um, showing you know, Hobart and Launceston and not much else. If you can sort of zoom in to the interactive version of this, um, this is a scaling in magnitudes of surface brightness uh, looking straight up. Um, so where there's sort of light gray or no shading, that's the sort of darkest natural sky or close to it. Um, but sort of in the center of Hobart, uh, down here you have maybe four magnitudes uh, brighter than that. Um, so you, you can see you go quite far out um, to the north um, with uh, some significant light pollution. And Mount Canopus was just, just there and the sort of almost, uh, almost too, uh, too bright to use for a, a one meter telescope. So um, when I arrived here, uh, in 2007, the plans were underway for a new telescope, and lots of uh, spots sort of in this area were being searched out. And on the basis of ease of access and uh, local landowners who were amenable to having a telescope on their property, uh, we chose a site that was just in here. Um, so Spring Hill is about, is about right there. Um, and uh, Oatlands would be, would be just up there. Uh, for weather purposes, you would probably prefer to be slightly more to the northeast, um, since uh, it seems to be the case that the weather gets clearer and drier the farther northeast you go in the state. Um, but this is, for practical reasons, it's about an hour from the university and um, relatively easy to get to, relatively inexpensive to put in the road and the electricity to get up there. So it was uh, a fairly dry part of the state, uh, ultimately dictated sort of by practical needs. So uh, we have this, this nice dark site. 
There are higher hills in the area, but um, again, the sort of dictates of pragmatism uh, suggested the specific one that we pick um, just there, about 650 meters. The highway is about 400 or 350 meters there, so the prominence above the, above the terrain isn't, isn't all that high. But you have a fantastic view uh, from the top. Uh, you can see uh, all the way to Ben Lomond in the north, uh, Mount Field over in the west. About the only mountain you can't see is Mount Wellington because uh, Coyne Mountain, which is about 800 meters, is, is in the way. So it must be the, only, must be the only place in Tasmania where you can see um, you know, Mount, Mount Field and Ben Lomond, but not Mount Wellington. Based on um, information we had from the Bureau of Meteorology, um, going back through the 1980s, uh, we expected that about, on average, maybe 30% of the hours uh, between sunset and sunrise would be usable. And that didn't mean sort of 30% really nice clear nights. What that meant was there might be an hour here or an hour there uh, shooting through gaps in the cloud. In the summertime, it's obviously quite a bit better than that. And in the winter, we're sort of lucky to get one night in five. Um, although, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the possibility of observing remotely, which would sort of increase our ability to find those holes and use them. Uh, since we started running the telescope a couple of years ago, uh, we found that our average image quality uh, is about 1.8 arc seconds images, which is um, pretty good with a uh, with a seeing monitor that doesn't have a large mirror and a dome around it to contribute uh, any extra turbulence, um, we've just found that it's possible to maybe push that a bit better. Keeping a 1.3 meter mirror kind of cool and adapted to the surroundings and preventing, preventing thermal plumes from sort of filling up the dome uh, probably makes up the difference between the 1.8 arc seconds that we see and what we think we can get to, which might be about 1.4, which would be really, really amazing. Um, if you tell people from like uh, the Australian National University or Siding Spring Observatory that, oh yeah, we have this hill in Tasmania and we can get 1.4 arc seconds. No, we don't believe that. Um, but I've seen it. Uh, I've seen images from our telescope with 1.1 arc seconds. So um, it is possible when the conditions are correct. So I guess one of the things to just highlight is that um, this is the only telescope in Australia uh, outside of the sort of Siding Spring Observatory in New South Wales, uh, larger than a meter, operated by kind of a regional university. So um, there are, that's sort of a, a chain of distinctions on, uh, on things. But it's, uh, it's an important point, um, and it makes the university um, sort of quite uh, uh, proud to have this, this facility. Um, it would be nice if they um, sort of supported it with uh, a bit more cash, but that's uh, um, maybe something to work on in the future. So the university now runs uh, a radio telescope network, which has um, uh, dishes uh, right the way across Australia, and it's the only university in the world to run a fully functioning network of radio telescopes. And we also have this... Uh, very nice 1.3 meter optical telescope as well, which is what I'll spend the rest of the time talking about. So that's the site. Another aerial photograph um, from just before it was uh, developed, obviously after a kind of a wet winter. Uh, now the road kind of comes up this way, and the telescope sits sort of just up here. And um, there they've sort of, this is in 2010 or 2011, uh, looking back to the south. Um, over the sort of typically dry Midlands area uh, when things were, were just being built. Uh, they've started building the uh, control room and the bedrooms here. And then there's the uh, uh, plywood forms for the, uh, for the pier that will hold the telescope. Uh, may not be really easy to see that just from that image, but there'll be a close-up. And um, this is a shot I took from the the Midland Highway, uh, about 5K away, uh, at the sort of maximum limit of my uh, camera, um, just to, to show that. Um, so it's you know, clearly visible from the highway if you know where to look. Um, and then just a uh, close-up shot of the 
telescope building um, and the, the dome. So the pier uh, rises to about this level. It's about five meters high just to get up above the boundary layer of uh, warm sort of air on the ground and to get up above the dust and, the, and other things. Um, so I think that contributes to the fact that we do have pretty good seeing uh, on the site. The dome is fiberglass. It was uh, provided by a firm in Queensland. Um, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a serious dome, 6.7 meters in diameter. And um, it's been a huge amount of difficulty um, in the windy kind of conditions that we get. This uh, lower part uh, sort of comes down like this and it makes a really nice sail. Um, the top part uh, slides back uh, very traditionally and that's no problem at all. But if we want to look closer than about 50 degrees above the horizon, we need to open the lower part. And that's um, basically been redesigned and rebuilt by the university uh, staff um, to be more sturdy. So um, many of you or some of you may know or have met John Greenhill. Um, he was the sort of driving force for optical astronomy at uh, UTAS for a number of years. Um, he got his PhD here in 1966 and uh, concentrated in the first half of his career on X-ray astronomy, um, launching balloons into the upper atmosphere. Of course, um, X-rays come from the very most energetic processes in the universe, um, neutron stars, black holes, um, novae. And um, John spent you know, uh, quite a bit of time looking at those systems. As uh, the technology advanced, it became clear that X-ray astronomy was going to be done from orbit by satellites. And um, so NASA uh, was sort of taking over the, the high ground, if you will, of X-ray astronomy. And so John slid into optical astronomy and took over the management of the one meter telescope and then kind of led the way into the development of the, of the new one. So there's John in about 2011 standing on the spot that would eventually hold the pier for the new telescope. Um, and we were trying to figure out how the plans related to what was actually being dug uh, in the ground at the time. Uh, so uh, we have a number of, uh, a number of uh, construction uh, type photos of, of the thing coming, coming together. And uh, luckily, uh, it was completed in time for John to do uh, some observing um, in the winter, uh, uh, just after the telescope was commissioned, and um, sort of contribute to science observations with the new telescope. So the observatory site and the buildings sort of as a whole are named for John. Uh, the telescope, the 1.3 meter, is named after a donor who uh, gave the telescope to the university. So we have the Harlington 1.27 meter telescope, or the H127, as we call it, uh, which sits there at the Green Hill Observatory. And um, it would be very nice to have some additional telescopes on the site and kind of build up, um, build up uh, sort of capacity there. Um, and the history of this telescope goes back uh, to before I was born, in fact. Um, at the time, the Canopus Hill 40-inch telescope was envisaged. It was thought that there would be a second telescope on the other side of the uh, building. There would be a 40-inch and then a 50-inch. And the 50-inch mirror was cast at Corning in, uh, in the US. Um, and then the funding never quite came through for the second telescope, and it became a challenge to get the 40-inch telescope working uh, properly. So the 50-inch telescope uh, sort of sat in maybe legal or some sort of other limbo uh, at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, which is in uh, uh, Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, it had been sent there to uh, be polished and coated. So um, yeah, I'm from New York, and uh, Corn and Glass is in New York, actually not far from where my grandparents lived. And working out from the shipping invoices, uh, when this mirror was trucked across North America to Canada, 
It's entirely possible that when I was seven months old, I passed this mirror on the road at, at some point. Um, obviously difficult to confirm, but it makes a great, uh, great kind of story. The mirror is finally being used. Um, uh, Casey Harlington is a Canadian, uh, basically a tech investor and a very keen amateur astronomer. He has an asteroid named after him, uh, I should say a minor planet. Um, and he has this uh, sort of trail of telescopes of larger and larger sizes. Uh, his previous largest one was an 80 centimeter telescope, which is in Hawaii. Um, so he was looking around uh, in the early 2000s for a larger telescope um, through his uh, sort of connections in the uh, Canadian amateur astronomy community. Uh, came to realize that there was this 50 inch mirror sitting around that nobody really knew much about. Um, they dusted it off and found that it said Tasmania on it. And he got in touch with John Greenhill and after some negotiations worked out that this mirror would be incorporated into a new telescope um, that he would have built and donate to the university in exchange for using some of the time um, being hosted here and we'd, we'd make him comfortable and, and uh, show him the wonders of the southern sky. Um, so that started a long process of uh, convincing the university that they should accept this deal and um, coming up with an optical design to use this 50 inch uh, mirror and having all the work done. So the, uh, the mirror in 2004 was uh, solid. It didn't have a central Cassegrain hole, um, but um, we decided that for collimation and, uh, and for certain types of observations, we would really like to have a central hole. So um, mirror went back to opticians uh, to, be, uh, to have a central uh, hole ground out. And it sort of passed through a succession of different opticians who uh, each found various uh, reasons to, uh, that, that they couldn't work on the system. The largest reason that sort of slowed things down and made things difficult is this is an 8 inch thick, 50 inch wide chunk of glass. It weighs about 490 kilograms. And many optical shops just don't uh, have the um, capacity to hold something that heavy even if they have the ability to test a 50 inch mirror, um, you know, they're used to working these days with sort of lighter weight, um, sort of borosilicate, um, you know, these uh, honeycomb uh, hexagon uh, things that might only weigh a third of what this weighs. Um, so what we came up with was an F8.5 or F8.7 system um, designed uh, or chosen so that the focal length was almost the same as the focal length of the one meter telescope. Uh, so that we'd have the same image scale as we were used to using for a number of continuing projects. So we would just take the camera uh, off of the one meter and pop it onto the, uh, onto the 1.3 meter. Um, it's a Ritchie Chrétien design and there's a sort of a triplet of corrector lenses uh, that corrects uh, both the coma and astigmatism um, out to quite a wide field of view. So uh, in principle, we could put a camera with 120 millimeter uh, CCD on and get a 36 or 40 arc minute field of view. We don't have the money for a camera that big, but the option is there. Um, so we have the potential for wide field imaging. Um, I've already mentioned we have the possibility to look through uh, by mounting a camera below and looking up through the central hole. Um, and there are ca cases where we'd like to do that. But most often the plan is to use the telescope with a tertiary mirror. So we would suspend a tertiary mirror here that's just a diagonal flat. And um, we could swivel a tertiary to either point to an imaging camera or swivel the other way and point to a fiber to feed a spectrograph. And um, that system actually is in place. It works reasonably well. We just don't quite have the spectrograph going yet. Um, but we could, in principle, switch back and forth between cameras very quickly uh, without recollimating uh, in the middle of a night. So just um, to sort of, sort of show this telescope being built up, this is the, uh, 
the base and the equatorial fork coming together in the workshop of this uh, um, amateur telescope maker who was uh, known to the donor of the telescope. So we had no particular control over the building or the design of the um, mechanical parts of the telescope, but we'd occasionally get these photographs sent to us. Does this look okay? Well, it looks like a telescope. It could look okay. Um, so we'd get these uh, photos, and you can see it's, it's, this base weighs sort of three tons. Um, it's a pretty significant uh, block of steel there uh, to balance the forks. And then you, you can see down at the bottom the bolts where it would uh, bolt onto the concrete pier. So we got these two. I took this photo, and then the same day, uh, that photo was sent. Um, so you can kind of see um, the, the pier coming together, the control room and the kitchen and bedrooms in the background, and, um, yeah, and the, the telescope itself, um, sort of the stainless steel serrurier truss, and uh, the Naismith uh, focus uh, coming through the declination bearings of the, of the telescope. Um, I forgot to put uh, photos of the crane lifting the telescope into position, which I, I should have done because they're pretty spectacular. Um, and then, yeah, um, I just I had to include this because it was a beautiful shot in, taken in July, I think, when uh, the building was, was coming together. So this is looking uh, north up towards the uh, central tiers um, with about an inch of snow on the ground. Um, and it does, does get quite cold up there. I've observed in about minus two, um, minus two degrees and 90% humidity, which is uh, a challenge. Um, let's see now. I've got a movie of when the mirror arrived. Um, because the mirror was handled by, I think, three different opticians, and the telescope uh, was built uh, separately, uh, those, and the secondary mirror was handled, again, by a different optician firm. None of those things ever came together until we unpacked the crate here in Tasmania. Uh, so you can imagine that might have been stressful. Um, so I, I had a camera set up to um, take a photo every minute. Um, so this is the 500 kilogram mirror in its crate, and um, we have a, a crane up top with a motorized lift, and um, there it is, just uh, going up. Very, very careful. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then up at the top, uh, so sort of five meters up, we have this uh, crane that had to be specially ordered. It turns out that the dome, uh, being fiberglass, was not nearly strong enough to hang anything from. Uh, the original plan was to have a very sturdy steel-framed dome that was custom-designed, but for cost reasons, at the last minute that got changed, and we just bought the off-the-shelf serious dome as a result. That meant we had to, you know, custom-make this, uh, this steel um, uh, crane with uh, just a, a motorized hoist there, and then lift the mirror up through the floor for that. Um, violated probably all kinds of health and safety recommendations from the university. Um, and we built a, we had a carpenter build us a practice mirror that was exactly the same shape and size out of plywood, and we practiced with that about four times uh, before we tried it with the glass. And then we had to figure out how to get the top ring uh, and do the, uh, and do the serrurier truss, so that's sort of the second video of us trying to put the whole thing together. And um, I hope we never have to, well, we'll have to take it apart anytime we wish to re-illuminize the mirror or, uh, or make any changes to the system. It's, I'm not looking forward to doing it. Um, I can come back and, and show those in a bit. So that's the, the end result. Uh, we have the uh, primary, which is a uh, fairly fast uh, mirror. I think the primary is f2.2. You see the mount for the tertiary mirror. The tertiary is not in place um, because you can't move the primary uh, when the tertiary is there. And then we have the uh, two declination bearings uh, where the, the tertiary would uh, send a light through either one of those. And then here's the, the wheel for the worm and wheel drive. So it's a very um, 
very simple drive system with uh, a worm and wheel, and there's a very similar looking one uh, on the right ascension. The, the deck wheel is about uh, that big across. Um, so there's another photo of the, uh, of the mirror just after it was installed. None of the motors or bearings are in place, uh, sorry, the bearing, none of the motors or uh, uh, gearing is in place at the time, so you can see we've very carefully tried to balance it and then have people holding ropes to keep it, uh, to keep it there so we could take the photo. Um, and then after getting the uh, secondary into place, um, this is just the first shot of the telescope um, looking sort of out the open flap of the dome. Um, the secondary is about a 16 kilogram uh, chunk of glass, um, which uh, sends things down either directly through uh, the Cassegrain focus or out through the tertiary out the side here. Um, so you can kind of see the telescope all uh, bare at that point. Uh, this is more or less what it looks like now. Um, you can see we've added quite a few counterweights. Uh, we were told that we would not need to do that because anything that left the builder's shop would be perfectly balanced. Um, but yeah, we needed quite a bit of lead. Fortunately, the university had uh, a long history of cosmic ray physics experiments that required lots and lots of lead shielding. And so we were able to just melt those down and build those into counterweights. Um, you can also see now that there's, we've got uh, baffling to keep stray light off. This, this photo is actually about 18 months old now. We have some more baffling uh, over here. Um, just the designer thought it would be nice to have a large uh, amount of open structure to let things uh, sort of cool off and uh, equilibrate and not get sort of plumes of heat building up inside a tube, but that makes it impossible to observe if there's any moon at all. Um, so we've been, we've been slowly uh, you know, covering those up as much as possible. And um, at the time this telescope was taken, uh, we were still using the direct through Cassegrain uh, focus. So there's a camera sitting down here that we've put uh, black cloth around to keep the, uh, keep the stray light off of that. So telescope uh, you know, has had, uh, I'd say, a long sort of painful teething process. Nearly every component except that three-ton steel base has been modified, uh, redesigned, rebuilt within Tasmania, um, either by the university engineering workshops, uh, by volunteers or staff members in the physics department, or uh, some things just uh, contracted out to various folks along the way. Um, talk a bit about that if you have questions at the end. Uh, we get reasonably okay images. So this is uh, one of the first images we took uh, of a nice southern globular cluster, NGC 1851. Um, it's reasonably bright nearby, uh, relatively extended. So this image is, I think, about 10 arc minutes across. Um, and it's just a, a bit of a 10 second exposure. You can see the really dense core, uh, sort of brighter red giants uh, from the outside. Um, so uh, sort of initial impression is uh, things are working pretty well. If you have really keen vision, you'll see that these stars aren't quite round. They have little, little rabbit ears on them. And that, chasing that down has become a real source of anguish uh, over the past sort of two years. We have a night sky camera uh, to help observers and to help students and staff members sitting in Hobart decide whether it's going to be worth driving up to the Midlands to actually do some observing. Um, so this is a Santa Barbara Instruments uh, camera. Uh, it's just mounted on a pole outside the observatory and um, it updates every minute or two, um, which is uh, actually gets some nice, nice views of the Milky Way especially. Um, it is, we should have we should have arranged for a color one so that we could see auroras, um, but uh, we've got what we've got. It's, it's quite sensitive. Um, you can obviously see the Magellanic Clouds um, and uh, lots of your favorite uh, dark nebulae in the Milky Way. Um, Is that on the web at all? Uh, it's sort of on the web. 
Um, it's on, a, it's on a server that's operated through the physics department, and the university keeps trying to make us stop hosting it, but they won't give us an alternative. So <laughs> um, it should be accessible, but it's often, it's often only accessible within the university, depending on who started work in the IT department recently and what they think about it. Um, so we'd like it to be more accessible. Uh, we're a little bit worried about load on servers and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, um, yeah, we're trying to, trying to work out how to make it sort of more publicly visible. Uh, of course, a lot of times it looks like this, uh, with snow accumulating. Um, we've discovered that although the meteorological report suggested that the hill would be high enough to get over most of the fog, it actually is often not. And I don't know if that's because they were looking at historical data and the climate is slightly different, or if it's just uh, that the resolution of the original imagery wasn't quite good enough. Um, but there's often the case that the Midland Highway is completely fogged over, especially in winter. But as you drive up the hill, you come up above that layer. And the temperature gets warmer as well. So it can be zero degrees or minus two on the road, but four or five degrees at the top of the hill. So we get this nice temperature inversion. The advantage is that it's very stable. And I think that contributes to why the seeing is better than we expected. Um, but occasionally, that fog decides it needs to be 700 meters high instead of 500 meters high. And it will roll in very, very quickly. So there have been times when I've been observing, looking out the dome slit at stars, perfectly clear. And if I go downstairs and open up the door to go down and get a cup of coffee, I can't see the other building because the fog has come up. And then I have to run up and close everything before it, before it pour, starts pouring into the dome. Um, so uh, in the winter, it's certainly quite a challenging uh, site to use. Um, in the summer, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I mentioned before about the little kind of rabbit ears you might see on the image. And this is a, uh, a close-up. So this is the Galaxy M83. Um, and it's just a very quick exposure without any guiding. Um, and there's a zoom in to that sort of area. And you can see that every star has a little, a little uh, comma attached to it. Um, and then sort of a second one, so it looks like a cat or a bunny rabbit or something. The actual image quality is, is sort of quite nice and sort of better than a couple of arc seconds. Um, but there's this flaw somewhere in the system that's producing um, this very distinct aberration. It's, um, it's not a simple astigmatism or a coma. Uh, it's not a collimation error. We've, uh, we've tried sort of all sorts of different uh, collimation uh, uh, combinations and, and um, as you go out of focus it disappears and when you come into focus it gets very strong uh, and we've we discovered that if we put a mask of uh, black core flute over the outer maybe 10 or 12 centimeters of the mirror it goes away and the images are perfectly circular and if we take the inverse of that mask if we mask off the inner one meter, we balance it on the tertiary mirror, then the images turn into perfect X's. So there's clearly something not quite right between the inner part of the mirror and the outer part. And the optician blames the person who designed the mirror support. And the person who designed the mirror support blames the optician. And we're trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, yeah. We've traced it to the primary. We know it's not the secondary. And uh, we know it's not the lateral constraints on the, on the mirror. But um, what the solution is, other than masking things off and working as a, as a one meter telescope, uh, has yet to be kind of worked out. So that's been quite a challenge. And unfortunately, it means that you know, our images look great from far away. But from close up, uh, yeah, if you want to work in a crowded field, um, it's, it's a, bit, a bit difficulty. So um, this is, came out a bit dark on the projector. This was observing one night in June. Um, the bottom part of the uh, dome is closed there. It's very hard to tell that we're 
observing nearly close to the zenith. There's obviously some bright moonlight reflecting off the solar panels. So the main, main camera we have is a fairly ancient CCD camera uh, with a 1024 CCD and a number of pretty standard observing filters, um, H-alpha and uh, ultraviolet, blue, visible, red, and near-infrared, and about a seven arc minute field of view. And that's sort of the standard one that we use. Um, we have a number of other options for observing objects within the solar system, so occultations. We have an electron multiplying CCD that's capable of taking an exposure every sort of 10 to 20 milliseconds. Um, it's got a very fairly small field of view, um, but we can take sort of 10,000 images in an evening and track very fast variations of reasonably bright things. Um, last uh, February and March, we hosted a group from Finland and they uh, um, uh, built a polarimeter for us. So that allows us to measure the plane of polarization of the light emitted by stars. Now most stars have very, very small or no polarization. So one part in a million of the light might be polarized. But some really interesting stars uh, have strong polarization. Binary stars, if they're trading matter via an accretion disk, uh, that can be highly polarized. If stars are very rapidly rotating, then they can be quite polarized. And um, in addition, there are certain lines of sight through the galaxy where the interstellar medium that contributes dust and reddening uh, will polarize light. So you can actually use the polarization of unpolarized stars to tell you something about the magnetic field and the dust in the Milky Way. And that's, uh, I found that quite fun observing um, because they, the Finns, did not care at all about image quality. Uh, all they wanted was uh, 10 million photons from every star. So you'd say, all right, we'll start an exposure and we'll take 700 exposures. And uh, yep, we've got to 10 million photons. Now we can move to the next star. And then you run it through some observing. And yes, that one's polarized at the level of one part in 10,000 or one part in 100,000. And uh, at the moment, we're writing up our first paper based on observations of the southern sky to look at the structure of how the Milky Way magnetic field is interacting with the solar wind, which um, is uh, kind of a very fun thing to do and something that's quite different uh, compared to what anyone uh, at the university was working on previously. Uh, we'd like to upgrade. Uh, we'd like to finish the fiber feed conversion of the spectrograph so we can get that spectroscopic um, sort of capability. And we'd like to have a really wide field imager to uh, get sort of a full moon of sky at a time um, since the telescope is capable of delivering that. Working sort of behind the scenes and underneath all this, we're still attempting to uh, diagnose and sort of repair the flaw with the primary mirror. Um, and work out how to best support it and best sort of regain the image quality that we think we can get. Um, I don't know if you'd like me to continue uh, for time. I just have a couple, couple of more things or you can go to questions. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Okay. Do you have any color images that, uh, that you brought with you? Um, I don't. Um, most of... <laughs> We've, we've gone straight from commissioning the telescope to we really need to start doing science. And sort of all over the past winter, our, uh, our main goal was just to uh, observe uh, events uh, as they change using only the infrared filter. So all of our sort of procedures and when we'd send, we'd send students out to the telescope we'd say you have to do this and if you have time to do something else you can do that but you must get all these infrared observations and so as a result we don't have very good matched uh, color images since the CCD uh, detector um, you know relies on just changing the filters and then uh, synthesizing those up we have sort of maybe two filters instead of three on a given night, or things were moved, um, or the focus was changed quite a bit. So um, 
my, one of my goals personally for the summer is to uh, use some of those nice observing nights when it's 20 degrees up there and there's no real rush and uh, really put together some nice color images that we can use. Um, I have to say I was a bit discouraged by the, by the rabbit ears on all the images and so I haven't gone out to do that as, maybe as quickly as I should have. Um, but yeah, I, I really, uh, it's one of the things I'd like to be able to do when classes are not in session. Um, so just to quickly kind of highlight one of our early science wins uh, when we were still sort of commissioning things. In 2015, NASA's New Horizons probe uh, flew past Pluto and took a huge number of uh, really amazing images and got a large amount of, of data on the uh, environment of Pluto and on, on its surface. It happens that two weeks before that flyby, there was an occultation uh, it was predicted to be visible from the southern hemisphere. So this is the occultation track. Um, if you're not used to looking at these things, the, the thick line is the center of the occultation. So that's the precise alignment between a background star and Pluto, and the Earth's uh, orbital and rotational motion sort of carries that shadow across that path. And then just like an ordinary eclipse, the sum width of the shadow. Pluto is about 1,200 kilometers across, so there's about a 1,200 kilometer shadow band on the Earth. And then the bars are error estimates because the position of the star is not known with 100% accuracy. So, so this was an estimate over where the shadow could possibly be. So, um, you know, we were quite interested in observing because uh, we had a very good chance of catching uh, the shadow. Uh, maybe not exactly along the center, but certainly um, catching some of the shadow. This was really interesting to people who were in charge of the New Horizons probe because they were in a dead panic that there might be rings around Pluto or other small moons and they'd smack into it. Um, by measuring uh, what material was blocking the light of the star, uh, there was a chance that they'd have enough advance warning to just correct the, uh, the uh, spacecraft trajectory by enough to miss things. So they were very keen to, uh, to get as much observation of the occultation event as possible to the point where they sent their 747 uh, with a 2.5 meter infrared telescope uh, to base it in Christchurch and they just sort of flew up and down along the, along the path of the track to try and catch it. Um, so what we did, we just sort of commissioned things. We just had the telescope working. Um, we have a long-standing collaboration with a group in Paris that studies occultations. And they asked us, well, can you use your high-speed photometer? This is the one that can read out every 10 or 20 milliseconds um, and, uh, and, get the, and get the occultation. At the same time, a group from the US, uh, the Southwest Research Institute in Colorado, said, we have this amazing room temperature infrared video camera, and we'll send it down to you if you promise to look at the Pluto occultation. Of course, then they took it away with them when they left, but um, for a while it was, it was very, very cool. Um, so we, we thought about it, and we said, well, we've already promised these guys, and we put them in contact with one another, and built this. So this is a, there's a half silvered mirror here, a dichroic. So the infrared light is reflected to that side, and the blue light is uh, passed through straight down, and so we were able to get both simultaneously. And uh, we were the only spot on Earth that was able to measure the occultation both in the infrared and in the visible at the same time, which uh, produced some really interesting constraints on the type of haze in Pluto's atmosphere, as it turns out. It turned out to be very interesting. Um, of course, the whole week before the occultation, it was cloud and rain, and so we never even found Pluto until the day of the occultation uh, to align that dichroic and the two cameras. But in the end, it worked out fairly well. Um, this is the star that Pluto was occulting. Pluto is, uh, you can't see because of the uh, uh, projector, but Pluto is just here. Um, so it's a 12.8 magnitude star. Pluto is about 15, and um, this was taken about three hours before the occultation. So there, 
just uh, maybe 10 or 15 arc seconds away from each other. Um, and you know, it was really kind of very exciting observing to wait and wait and wait. And so, is it going to go? When's it going to go? Oh, it was supposed to go. Oh, there it goes. Um, so what we ended up with, um, the infrared data was horrible looking, and it had to be processed uh, a huge amount to get anything out of it. But the visible light data came out really nicely almost immediately. Um, so what we have is the light of the background star at 12.8 magnitude, and then Pluto passing in front of it, um, and going down to about 15th magnitude at the, uh, at the lowest point. If there was no atmosphere, if it was just a bare rock, then the rock would pass in front of the star, and the starlight would cut off, and then uh, it would cut back on again very sharply. But because there's an atmosphere, the light is attenuated, fades through, just like uh, we were discussing Venus earlier. Um, so the light is passing through. If we had perfect alignment, if we were right on the shadow line of the center, the atmosphere would, uh, would refract that light and we'd get a spike in the middle. Unfortunately, we weren't. The, the center of the shadow went over New Zealand. Um, but our data contributed quite a bit to characterizing the temperature and pressure of Pluto's atmosphere uh, before New Horizons got there. So we told them what they were going to see uh, in some sense. But what they were really also interested in was we have three hours of data before this and a couple hours after this with no sign of rings or unknown moons. So smooth sailing ahead for the satellite, which was, which was a great relief, I think, to them. Um, so that was sort of one of the early kind of nice, uh, really spectacular things that came out of the telescope. Um, did you get, uh, so did you actually get the, 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 the bulk of the planet rocking the light there? Because it's not quite straight as a line. Yeah, we were. Uh, just grazing, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we didn't quite ever get to the surface. Um, and um, yeah, it turned out to be quite a surprise that although Pluto was moving farther away from the sun in its elliptical orbit, uh, and there were predictions that its atmosphere should be cooling down and shrinking as it moved farther away from the sun. In fact, the occultation data from that 2015 event showed that the atmosphere is staying warm, um, presumably because there's uh, interaction between all the surface ices and the atmosphere. Um, so I had an atmospheric physicist explain it to me, but I didn't quite follow uh, the chain of logic. But the 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 point that I took away from the explanation was that we have to wait until 2025 uh, to know if, if the explanation is correct. So I'm happy because that takes me through the next sort of eight years of my career, um, and I can, I can keep doing things. Um, so I thought I'd leave with uh, just a nice image on a clear night through the slit. Um, this was taken by my PhD student, and um, I'm happy to discuss sort of any aspect of it or yeah, any other questions. So thanks. Yeah, so that's the plan. Because of the weather conditions and the kind of our lack of faith in the dome, uh, we haven't yet done that. In principle, we could. Um, but we don't want to damage anything. So we've been putting in fail-safes and backup systems and writing computer programs to make sure that if anything ever loses contact with Hobart, that it shuts itself down. And um, I just had a discussion with uh, the main person responsible for doing all that. And he said he's going up to fix part of the dome tomorrow. And he's going to leave everything turned on when he comes back. So that means that we could log in from Hobart and actually play with it if we wanted to. Uh, for the, uh, that would be for the first time. Um, so up till now, uh, it's always been, well, if everything goes OK, and if the weather is perfect, we could observe from here. Um, by the time, say, I'd say in six months, the next PhD student I have will be able to do all our observing remotely. 
I think that, you know, they should still go up there because it's more fun. Um, but if you have to teach a 9 a.m. lecture um, and you drive an hour up and you open up and you only get an hour's worth of data through the cloud and then you have to come back and, and teach at 9 a.m., uh, that can be quite uh, taxing. You get, in the, you get in the situation that I was in last year where I walked into the wrong class and started lecturing, lecturing <laughs> the wrong lecture. <laughs> Um, so at the moment, um, what we're using is we have the ability for a 36 arc minute field of view. So the focal plane is, is like 120 millimeters across, but our CCD camera is quite small. So what we've got is an XY stage, um, and it was designed for something really bizarre. I can't remember now. Designed for like I want to say dental work, but that doesn't sound quite right. But there's a little XY platform that you can send commands to. And we have a Starlight Express, uh, I think it's a CMOS guider, that sits on that stage. And we built a little table that says, you can go to these places without blocking the main camera. And it, it has about a one arc minute field of view. And so we have a separate camera, but not a separate telescope. And yeah, so those photos were uh, from 2016. Um, as of the beginning of 2017, we have guiding working. Um, there's some software that's sort of freely available called PHD2. And um, with the, the Starlight um, camera and the stage that we had to write some software for and the PHD2 guider, uh, we have a telescope tracking a star to about two tenths of an arc second over an hour long exposure. Uh, so, very, very happy with that. No. Um, if you turn off the guiding, you get those uh, and they just they smear out. Um, and they're always the same position angle. One test we did, this was difficult because the mirror weighs 500 kilograms, but we, uh, we took uh, wheelbarrow inner tubes and inserted them under the wiffle tree support for the mirror. And we had three people with bicycle pumps <laughs> and one person on the guider uh, reading out images every second on a bright star uh, to try and keep it in the field of view. And we pumped up the inner tubes, and the person on the camera would say, no, no, north, up, <laughs> south, down. Uh, and, and we lifted the mirror off of the support pads while observing, and uh, that distortion didn't go away. So we think it's not the supports. We think it's in the surface of the primary. Um, just, just about everything we've done, um, we can't get rid of it unless we physically mask off a very like 20% of the mirror area. It's quite large. So this, uh, well, for the telescope control, yeah, for the telescope control, we use something called sidereal SciTech. Um, so uh, sidereal technology. Um, and um, that's a firm in the US. And that came uh, with the telescope when it was donated to us. Um, he's been, the, the main author is a hardware guy, as he describes himself, and he doesn't like software. But we've kind of gotten him to, to update quite a few things. And he's been very responsive to questions uh, because there aren't many of his systems in the southern hemisphere. Um, so he's been very, uh, really f uh, good about sharing uh, all of his kind of inside knowledge and how to set things up with the guider, um, how to correct for periodic error in the worm, um, and all the various sort of different little things that come up. Um, so sidereal technology. For image processing, um, it, it kind of depends on the specific project, um, but mostly... Um, 
things that are sort of freely available but custom and may not work because they were written by astronomers and not by computer programmers. A lot of the processing is done on sort of Sun workstations or Linux workstations and not on sort of Microsoft-based systems. Um, so that's not the case in, in, in every case. Um, so yeah, we don't have a single we don't have a single kind of uh, pipeline set up yet. Do you, you don't actually trust the uh, mechanics to close the dome? Uh, or you're not super confident at this point? When the wind gets up, and by up I mean anything above maybe 15 kilometers an hour, uh, it's very unreliable. Um, it depends okay. on a... The sliding one is fine, yeah, yeah. but the sliding one won't move until it gets a signal that the bottom one is closed. Yeah. Um, and there are a number of limit switches, and they, you know, the wind will sort of take it and close the limit switch, and then the thing's half open, and then the top one won't close. It's taken some redesigning. We've uh, strengthened them. We've changed the position of the limit switches. Um, it's still not a great design. Yeah, something like that. Okay, next question. <laughs> we, How many different communications have you got from DigiKit to Uta? Uh, so we have a microwave link to, uh, that goes to the fiber between Hobart and Launceston. So that fiber goes through, um, not Mouth and Mowbray, uh, Jericho. Jericho. Uh, so we ha our, our microwave dish looks down the hill uh, across the Midland Highway to Jericho. And um, if you go off the highway and drive down through Jericho, you can find the, the other dish that looks back up at the hill. Um, and then from there, it's just onto the, the fiber. And that's 100% reliable, that microwave link? I mean, weather doesn't... The weather doesn't affect it. Uh, if it does go down... No. We have the original microwave link that, that the university used to communicate before the fiber. Um, so it goes from Coin Mountain to Vincent's Hill and then further up. So that's not fiber speed, but I think it's 150 megabit per second. And no one else on the university is using it now, except for us. They're required to keep it open for in case somebody you know, takes a digger and cuts the fiber. Um, so they're required to keep that link open, but nobody's using it except for us, which is fantastic. Of course, we're not using it now anyway because we're on the fiber, but we did for a few years. Well, what sound wave have you got with the fiber? I can't remember now. Um, we worked out that if we, if we took the biggest possible CCD camera we could get, uh, and which would make sort of 180 megabyte images, and we took them at a rate of sort of uh, you know, 30, seconds, 30 second exposures that We'd, we'd sort of back everything up if we wanted to send those down in real time. Uh, we're not close to that. I can't remember what the speed is now, but it's, the reason I can't remember is just because it's far larger than anything we're sending down. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, um, yeah, what, what can legally be done as far as finding we asked, we asked the university for $100,000 to make the dome completely robust in the last sort of round of funding. But um, while, they, while they acknowledged the problem, there were other projects that got a higher priority. So that's about the right order of magnitude for getting the dome sort of redesigned and completely reliable. The, uh, the problem with the mirror, of course, if we have to get a whole new mirror, that's significantly more than that. <laughs> and then just to make sure the problem is getting up in the view. Yeah, I mean, our wish list has million dollar cameras, but that's, that's not a design flaw. Yeah. 
It's, um, we're much more manpower limited than funding limited. Well, funding is necessary too, but, but we really need people. Yeah, um, they sort of disagree with each other, though. Um, <coughs> so we've had a number of uh, discussions and a number of analyses done, and it points to uh, the most likely thing on the weight of evidence, as I see it, is that uh, the uh, Mirror was probably not supported correctly during polishing. And um, while, while it was sitting there, it was polished to the correct figure. But then when it's supported on the Wiffle tree, it's sort of relaxed into a slightly different shape. Um, what a, a, a careful analysis of in focus and out of focus images showed is that there are this sort of a pattern of high spots. On the, on the mirror. Um, and by high, I mean sort of a, a couple of wavelengths worth. So not, not talking about lambda over eight or anything. This is like lambda. <laughs> um, and then, then two opticians disagreed with each other about whether they were high spots or low spots. Um, <laughs> obviously, if it's a high spot, that's great. You just polish it down. If it's a low spot, you have to take off a huge amount of glass. Um, we had, we had, unfortunately, we didn't have control over the mirror when it was being finished. So we have some interferograms that were created, and you cannot tell that there's anything wrong with the mirror from them, but I'm not convinced they were sufficient that we would have been able to see anything. And yeah, the optician still insists that. He still insists that he says, all right, maybe things were not 100% perfect in my shop, but it can't possibly create what you're seeing. Um, so yeah, uh, we had an optician out from the European Southern Observatory, who is the, the head optician on the La Silla mountain, where the 2.5 meter and 3.5 meter new technology telescopes are. Um, he has about 35 years of experience in keeping those telescopes aligned and used 330 nights a year, and um, he was stumped. <laughs> um, so he still thinks he still thinks it's connected to the support, um, but we lifted the mirror and rotated it through 90 degrees, and the pattern changed with the rotation, and it didn't stay with the support. Um, so we've talked to a number of people, each of whom have said, we think it could be this, but we're not sure. And what each person thinks is different from what another person thinks. Um, a company in Tucson, Arizona, suggested that the mirror was actually uh, fractured and that, um, and that uh, it had accumulated a large amount of stress. Um, and that there could be a small surface chip that could produce all this stress. And he presented this, this case, and he said he'd seen it a number of times and it was consistent with everything. And I said, this mirror is 40 years old. He said, no, forget it then. <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> so, so perhaps just to put it in context, uh, how, you, uh, when, how usable would the telescope be in its current configuration? If we're happy to use it as a one-meter telescope, perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, for example, the polarimetry group that came down, and we looked at nearby stars for the magnetic field of the galaxy, and we looked at some interacting O star binaries to see uh, how their accretion disks were polarized. Perfectly happy with it. Um, so for some projects, it will be great. Uh, for projects like finding planets towards the center of the Milky Way, where stars are so close packed together that you know, every little bit of image quality counts. It's kind of a disaster. Um, you say you, you masked the, the central part, leaving, what, 20% exposed, and you got the cross shape. 
Yeah. He didn't try then last and get a portion of what was remaining. Try and find it. That's the right. Mm. Um, He's got the central mark of the outer whatever it is, 150 mil or something. He's just sort of marked portions yeah. of that. Yeah. So we did the opposite to that, where we put the uh, we put the arcs around the outside, yeah. and we masked off like an eighth at a time or a quarter at a time. Yep. And while there is clearly a bad quadrant, uh, we didn't see really good images until we'd masked virtually the entire thing. And I tried to work out how it could be, and I kind of wonder if the central part has one optical axis and then the outer part has a slightly different optical axis, so that like along one specific diameter line, it's OK, but you know, one side is high and the other side is low. Um, it, would be, it would be like this, yeah. Well, um, yeah, and the answer is just uh, cost oh. and um, space. So you'd have to put the lens probably, um, I mean, if you wanted to use it at the straight through cast grain focus, you only have a 250 millimeter. Uh, a 250 millimeter diameter, and there's no uh, mechanics there to hold anything. It's just the center of the mirror. And if you wanted to go through the, uh, the declination axis, it's, it's still quite limited space. Um, there's not a lot of back focal distance. So um, you know, mainly, mainly just cost and space. Um, and we could probably keep following the questions or not. Let's be conscious of time. At this point, we'll finish up. But if there are, Andrew, you might have a few more minutes. Sure, yeah. A few people that want to ask some more questions. Well, that's been a uh, fantastic presentation. Thoroughly enjoyable presentation, Andrew. And I'm Thanks. sure everyone here will like to join in. And thank, yeah. thank Andrew.